All right. Uh, so, uh, as we were talking about yesterday, they said they were going to be uh, introducing some new stuff um, for season one, basically, on top of the stuff they were talking about yesterday. Uh, I wasn't going to do a video for it because I wasn't sure how much was going to be there, but it does look like there's a fair amount here. Um, so here we are. Uh, we're going to look over the, uh, what are they calling it here? Uh, the season one roadmap plus development philosophy. Uh, hi, everyone. In yesterday's announcement, we introduced a large or a lot of changes as well as the design philosophy for preseason before the storm. Today, we want to share some of our thoughts so we can discuss the upcoming changes for season one db reforged i hope they don't call it db reforged i hope that's just short for dungeon born and they're just gonna call it dungeon born uh so without further ado let's get into it part one uh seasonal realm and eternal realm uh when season one starts the eternal realm will be available and all your progress in season zero will be preserved at the same time a seasonal realm will also be opened give everyone a fresh start. However, the vast majority of new content will only be available in the seasonal realm and the game modes in the eternal realm will rotate to reduce the total amount of queues. Uh, the, uh, this seasonal system is similar to common industrial practices such as Diablo or Path of Exile. We're also considering, we're also considering to plan some game modes in the middle and late stage of, this, of the season it allows characters from the Eternal Realm and Season Realm to play together. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, basically for anybody that hasn't played like Diablo or PoE or anything with the seasonal thing, um, basically the Eternal Realm, you're going to have a permanent server, we'll call, uh, and that's the Eter Eternal Realm, right? So I don't know how they're going to transfer everything. If I assume they're going to transfer things, but basically... You're going to have this one permanent server that is there forever, or at least for the life of the game. Um, and if you make a character there, they will, let's say you max level at 20 or whatever with a, a rogue. That rogue will always be available to you. You'll always be able to play there. All the loot you get will, it's permanent. All that stuff will be there. When a season starts, it's a temporary server. So... You're going to play on the season. You're going to get, as they said, most of the new stuff is going to be in these seasons, which is pretty typical for a season type system. Um, you'll be able to basically play a new character. You'll have to start fresh. You'll start a new character, go through that season. Once that season ends, typically what happens is it takes your character, all your loot, everything, and transfers back, uh, transfers back to the Eternal Realm. So now you'll have a second character in the Eternal Realm plus all the loot that comes over from that season. Again, I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know if they're going to send it all in a uh, in a mail or if they're going to give you like a temporary stash tab with all this, the loot, that kind of stuff. I don't know how they're going to do it, but that's like typically how it goes. Uh, and then season two comes around and then you do season two. It's a brand new character, brand new servers, do all that, rinse, repeat. Um, Basically, it gives people a reason to start over, but if you don't want to start over and you want to just keep playing, um, you're going to have the Eternal Realm, right? Now, keep in mind with the Eternal Realm, there's not going to be any resets or wipes or anything like that. So it's just going to be like, you're going to be going to get up against people as well that are just like not getting wiped. They're going to have all their gear, all that stuff, um, and be able to build up millions and millions of gold, billions even. So that's basically how that's going to work. A uh, part two, pet system. You heard it right. A pet system that all classes can try out that's not par primarily designed for combat. What does it mean by all classes can try out? Um, your pet will have a special inventory that can hold loot. Uh, each game, you will have an opportunity to command your pet to carry this loot and extract early. This inventory can be upgraded and expanded through investments by playing. <laughs> Get bigger saddlebags for your pet otter or something. Um, shit, I lost my spot. Uh, will be expanded through uh, through playing. And eventually, your loyal pet will take on the important task of extracting the most valuable loot for you. Uh, 
so that's good you're gonna be able to upgrade and expand it through playing um so i mean now i've been giving these guys shit lately not that i'm like not that i care a ton if you like copy something from another game as long as you like do your own thing with it and and kind of expand on it make it better whatever not just straight up copy it uh, i've been giving them shit for some of that but this is it's, it's something right they're expanding on the secure container it's now a secure pet i guess i'm curious how it'll work like you just load all your good shit into this pet click go home and then just poofs uh, i don't know how that's gonna work i don't know if it's gonna be like your pet opens up a portal and you gotta sit and protect your pet for 30 seconds or something while it channels this portal i don't know i don't know how that's gonna work um i i can see it being bad at the same time too right um you get somebody that loots like crazy runs to the edge of the map and just sends their pet home and then they have no risk anymore and they can just go towards the uh the center of the map to do their own extract right i'm, I'm curious how that's going to be um we hope that the pet system can implement the classic safe container design in extraction games in a way that is more in line with db's fantasy world to ensure that all players have a guaranteed way to extract loot every game and win if they die we also hope that everyone will be uh, more willing to take more risks because of this guaranteed mechanic uh, it's worth mentioning that the pet system will not be an exclusive system for paying users and players will be able to participate all players will be able to participate in it so that's good um not uh well fuck arena breakout and they're bullshit but looking at tarkov obviously you have to buy the game to begin with but everybody gets access to a secure container in tarkov um obviously people that pay more money have a bigger secure container which can be significant those few extra spots can be significant but this is nice i'm curious they say it's going to be available for everybody and that you can upgrade through playing and stuff like that but i'm i'm curious if they're gonna gonna try and do something i mean i guess the monetization side of it is they just charge for different pets right you can get a, a lizard or a bat or a dog or a whatever and that's where they would make their money on it um basically everybody has a secure container but you upgrade it with a skin um and change it that way uh i hope that is the direction they go i think that's uh would be the more ideal one and i think they would i i would spend money if there's like some cool skins and stuff for it um whereas if they were just kind of scumming it and only giving it to people that paid money for the actual secure container system i probably wouldn't um and that's why i said fuck arena breakout and left that dog shit game behind um but yeah interesting we'll see how that plays out part three heirloom rework so we were talking about this uh in the comments of my last video uh there was talk about the air uh, heirloom rework and i said it was probably coming in season one uh so here we go for adjusting the de uh, definition of high tier heirlooms in season zero the ability to customize affixes on high quality heirlooms proved extremely valuable in combat for season one top tier heirlooms will be redefined as high power equipment becoming one of the end game gear choices this means they will require more re resources to craft uh, to acquire and craft but in return will grant high quality heirloom uh will grant high quality heirlooms even stronger capabilities than they currently possess. Low quality heirlooms will serve as free betting stakes or cheap gear to help new players reduce gear fare. With the introduction of new map difficulties, we've also decided to implement a popular community suggestion, the ability to craft previously unlocked heirloom qual uh, qualities. Players can choose which quality of heirloom to be crafted uh, based on their goals, whether you want to create cheap entry-level equipment or powerful endgame gear to accompany you in battle, the choice is yours. So again, not, this was something, again, myself and many others have suggested, is being able to down downcraft your, uh, your heirloom stuff. Because once you upgrade it to the max, you've now locked yourself in to that max piece of equipment. 
Um, you're always going to get that extra gear score from it. You're always going to be put in higher lobbies with it, that kind of thing. Um, and you might run out of materials and not be able to afford the high tier stuff. So then you're now just all that investment you put into upgrading your heirlooms has gone to waste because you can't, can't use it. So that, it's a nice change. Um, part four. Oh, wow. Okay. This is a, a little weird because it was got the highlight on the top part. Uh, part four combat balance rework. Throughout season zero, we received tons of feedback on balance and engaged in a thorough discussion in to realign our vision. We'd like to share our insights with you. Uh, action interactivity. All class skills should be able to interact with weapon attacks, defense, or player movement and positioning. This, ensu this ensures that melee versus range combat doesn't feel disconnected and that all skills slash spells have counterplay options. The recent rework of the Cryo's Frostbite Curse is a good starting point, although Cryo's stats are a bit lower after the adjustment. We'll continue making adjustments in this direction, so stay tuned. Should be able to interact with weapon attacks. If oh, okay, so I think what it means is like, when they talk about interact, it's like you should be able to block everything or have some kind of counterplay to it, right? So. Frostbite curse, you could do nothing about it. They looked at you, they clicked the button, it was on you. That was it. You couldn't block it, you couldn't nothing. Um, so it sounds like they're working, uh, working towards that. Shortening melee time to kill. Although from a dummy DPS perspective, melee classes are not inferior to ranged classes. However, as players become more proficient in defense, counter, and movement techniques, the melee time to kill is significantly uh, currently significantly longer than the ranged burst time to kill uh, and much longer than common extraction PvP games. The longer melee time to kill leads to fewer surprises, amplifies differences in play, uh, play skill and equipment power and makes it more difficult to win with fewer number numbers or weaker power, ultimately discouraging players from taking risks. In Season 1, we plan to shorten the uh, melee time to kill by increasing the damage of melee weapons without affecting the damage efficiency of offensive skills. Okay. Again, that's going to be just something we have to wait and see how it plays out. Um, I personally never really had too much of an issue with the melee time to kill. It's always been more about like catching people. Uh, again, I, I mostly play fighter DK. So it's been mostly about catching people and then killing them. That's the... The problem is that the catching part and keeping them close enough to kill them. Um, but we'll see. I mean, this could help classes like Rogue uh, be a little bit more melee focused. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. I, I, I don't know how it's going to go with like mages and stuff, right? Because they're already fairly squish squishy. If you can get up to a pyro, uh, avoid all their fireballs and stuff and get right up in their face usually you can kill them pretty damn quick um again it's this is all it's all stuff we have to wait and see we have to see how it plays out we have to see how the testing goes um a lot of these changes it's just gonna be you, you need to see them in practice to be able to to tune them more uh clarify the roles of classes or specific skill combinations we will use common roles from uh, RPGs and MOBA games to clarify our classes, such as tanks, fighters, assassins, mages, uh, which they consider ranged burst damage, marksmen, ranged sustain damage, etc. Uh, this will create a clear uh, cyclical countering relationship for different roles and playstyles, encouraging the game environment uh, uh, to dynam dynamically balance itself. I assume they want it to be like a rock paper scissors type thing where like you know in like those uh gotcha type games where you got like oh this faction's weak to this faction and this faction's weak to this faction it's just like a circle i wonder if that's what they mean so like tanks are going to be better against fighters and fighters are going to be better against assassins and assassins are going to be better than mages and then mages come back around and they're better against tanks oh i forgot marksman you get the idea. Um, I'm curious if that's what they're aiming for. I don't know how that's going to play out, but we'll see. 
For example, we want the Death Knight to be a frontline initiator, but we haven't given them enough tank capabilities. On the other hand, the pre-nerf Cryomancer through uh, ice, barrier healing, uh, ice Barrier Healing, Frostbite Curse Healing, Life on Hit Healing, and Fairy of the Lake Shield had the abilities of two class rolls simultaneously. Range sustain damage plus tank, causing his power to overperform and making it impossible to counter. Okay, so that means we're we're getting more cryo nerfs. So it sounds like I mean the thing is is like I'm not against classes having multiple um roles, right? Like a DK being like a tank and a damage dealer um mages being i don't know range damage and i don't know i'm not opposed to having two different roles within a class but it's when one uh, one class has all those roles and the other classes only have one that's where it becomes an issue but again we'll see um they they seem to want to make very specific and defined rules here uh the balance content discussed above is still under active development and internal testing the season one launches expect a comprehensive round of adjustments and refinement based on our findings stay tuned for more updates again like i said you need to do mass testing even uh internal testing is only going to get so far you're only going to have a limited view window in with internal testing um you, you need that massive testing uh to really kind of hone in so hopefully they're they're in tune with that part five monsters rework currently regular monsters in the game provide a fairly basic and one-dimensional combat experience players essentially trade time or health to acquire resources in season one, we aim to introduce more engaging and varied mechanics that go beyond simple combat. Um, for instance, some regular monsters will be tuned to be incredibly easy to kill, uh, but disturbing them may greatly increase your risk of being detected and exposing your position. Other monsters might possess high frequency self-healing abilities, requiring players to quickly end the battle through burst damage or heavy hitting mechanics. Uh, to core... To enhance the core combat experience, we plan to allow certain monsters to use character class skills and even boss abilities. Hmm. Um, this will give new players a chance to gradually learn and adapt to skill-based counterplay during PvE, preparing them for challenging Pv uh, PvP combat and boss fights. Okay, before we go any further, what would actually be really cool is... I don't, I don't know how well it would work in this type of game, but I've always thought this would be super cool for like RPGs and stuff, but having like rival, a rival group, right? Like think about Baldur's Gate or something like that. You're roaming around in your party of four or whatever. Is it four or is it five or is it six? God, I don't remember. Either way, let's say you're roaming around your party of four, right? You run into another party of four another party of four that's out there doing their quests and shit another adventurer group i think that would be kind of cool so they're talking about um having certain monsters use character class skills and stuff um even something like um like i guess it's a mimic but it's not like think about the mimic from um elden ring it straight up just copies you Imagine you run into something like that that like copies you and you have to fight yourself basically. Something like that would be pretty cool. Um, but also just like running into random like AI rogues or mages or whatever. Um, other adventurers out there that aren't necessarily... The problem there is it starts getting too close to just adding bots to the game, right? Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that in BRs. Nobody likes. Nobody wants to play against bots. Let's. Well, okay, some people might, but I. I think the mimic idea would be a little bit cooler, where it's like this special monster that kind of basically clones you. Um, yeah, I think. I think if you ran into like AI classes out there, it'd just be a little bit too much, like running into the bots. Anyway, I'm curious to see what they do with that. 
Uh, elite monsters and bosses currently present a high risk, high learning curve challenge, but once mastered, they can feel repetitive and lack compelling reasons to re-engage. Uh, moreover, their design often fails to properly account for ranged DPS characters, leading to significant disparity in clear times and difficulty between melee and ranged classes. This in turn results in a more conservative, drawn out and boring bossing experience. Yeah, I mean, especially like elite monsters. I think the bosses are a little tougher, except maybe Cyclops. Like once you know Cyclops move set, you might get caught every once in a while on some like desync or jank or something like that. But Cyclops is pro uh, most likely the easiest boss and honestly might be easier than some of the some of the elites like the the uh, Reaper. Fuck that guy. He's too scary for me. Um, but yeah, like. There's so many ways you can like cheese bosses where they can't even touch you and I, I hope they kind of find ways to uh, to deal with that. Um, where are we? Drawing inspiration from games like Monster Hunter, we intend to address these shortcomings through better stage design and mechanics that equalize the damage windows for melee and ranged characters. Players will be able to capitalize on these damage windows and potentially extend them by exploiting skillful or employing skillful and action-oriented counterplay. The goal is to create a more dynamic, comfortable time to kill and an overall more engaging progressive combat experience that encourages mastery and replayability. These adjustments and refinements will be an ongoing process through season one as we gather data and player feedback. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. So I've been giving these guys a hard time lately, but like, it, it, this this is what we want from them. It, it, well, I can't speak for everybody, but this is the stuff I want from them. I want this thoughtful, like insight into what they're thinking. I want to know that they're they're thinking about all this stuff. This stuff, this is fucking fantastic shit. All this stuff is great. Um, this is just the stuff they need to be doing and keeping up with. More importantly, they could have had this stuff for the past month or two. And they've just been holding it back from us and we don't know and we just think they're fucking over there with their dick in the wind um this is the stuff we need from them more of this stuff part way i need a drink hold on man this is a lot. like i've been reading a lot these last couple days okay part six Thoughts on solo and team play. First and foremost, we want to assure our players that Dungeonborn will be not be abandoned, uh, will not abandon solo play. Thank fuck. Uh, we've carefully considered the relationship between solo and team play from various angles, and we'd like to share insights with you in a transparent manner. Uh, if we were to completely separate solo and team play environments, it would likely uh, it would require entirely different designs for both sides, including class balance, combat design, map structure and routes, map mechanics, boss mechanics and economy. Our class balance adjustments based on solo balance would inevitably fail uh, to ensure a satisfying team play experience and the introduction of collaborative map mechanics would not translate well to solo play. Take class design as an example. Dungeonborn's class skills are largely inspired by League and WoW, where combat balance has always been designed around team play. Neither of these games offer solo play as their official or main game mode. However, when we look at successful extraction games in the industry, they usually allow solo and trio players to share the same stage, uh, and solo players can find still find enjoyment. Dungeonborn experimented with mixed team matchmaking during the early playtests, but the experience was not good at all. So what exactly is Dungeonborn missing or where do we go wrong that caused our mixed team matchmaking to be unfriendly to solo players? Wait, is that a, are they asking us or are they about to tell us? Um, that caused our mixed team matchmaking to be unfriendly to solo players. I'm not sure. Was there like a, oh, maybe it's the challenger mode they're talking about. It's the only thing I can think of. Or are they talking about like randomly queuing? Because I can tell you right now, if they're talking about like a random, it's just like uh, Clothos's trial and just the, the 3v3 in general. No, no communication at all. Not even text chat. Um, and, and yeah, no VoIP to be able to talk to your teammates. That's the huge first step. So I don't know if that's what they're talking about, but we'll see here. 
Uh, but I understand. I understand that it's very difficult. Their main focus, it's just like Apex Legends, right? Their main focus is threes. Um, three man teams, solo really isn't a thing because of the the balance issues, right? You it, look at look at uh, priests, for example. Per, uh, is that what, I keep forgetting if they're clerics or priests. Priests. Um, priests are pretty dog shit in solos, but are like ridiculous in threes. Um, so I, I understand it. I understand that there's going to be those issues where it's just it's impossible to be able to perfectly balance every single class for both trios and solos um so, so i mean i get it um I, I get it uh pvp time to kill and combat range dungeon Mortar's time to kill especially for melee is significantly longer than in shooter games making it extremely difficult to fight against multiple opponents 100 percent. you look at something like tarkov when you're going up against a group of five it's still difficult but it's a lot more doable because you can one tap somebody in the face quickly one tap two people in the face and now it's down to a three on one already right um there's a lot more uh there's a, the ability to put reposition and stuff a lot more in something like tarkov as well so that i i can definitely understand um Melee characters also have short range and are in danger once engaged in combat. Yeah, it's it's like you can't sit at range and like trade shots and stuff and reposition easy. Once you're in it, you're in it as a melee character. Um, PVE, TTK, number of mobs and mob positioning. In Hunt Showdown, for example, there are fewer mobs and the uh, kill time is within two seconds. Players spend more time scouting, planning routes, and avoiding env uh, environmental creatures like crows that could expose their position compared to Dungeonborn's current state. This significantly reduces the difference in advanced speed between solo and trio, uh, trio teams. Very true, too. I, I don't have a ton of time in Hunt Showdown, but I've got a few hundred hours, probably. And yeah, it's it's definitely a lot slower paced. You're, you're trying not to, like, spook the crows and stuff like that. And if you do... It gives other people a heads up that you're coming. There's not really anything like that in Dungeon Board. Um, so you kind of just... There's like minor things. Like you can read situations if no, and know if somebody's around. Like if there's a dead mob somewhere or if they're like pathing back to where they're supposed to be, you can tell somebody has just gone through there. There's ways, but they're not like super pronounced ways. Um, environmental complexity and ease of information gathering. The core resource uh, areas in shooter extraction games are often designed as buildings with more complex terrain, making it harder to gather information. However, Dungeon Morn's level design makes it easier to obtain information, uh, and the abundance of monster corpses can expose a player's previous route. I mean, it, it, that's kind of the same with, uh, with Tarkov, too. But again, there's not as many. There's not like a million scavs around, but like you can go through a place and you find a dead scav. You know, somebody's been there. Uh, there's also the fact that you can hear gunshots a lot further than you're going to be able to hear somebody swinging a sword. Usually. Um, poison circle and random portal extraction. The poison circle forces solo and trio players to confront each other directly rather than allowing uh, solo players to choose, or choose whether to challenge teams with more players. Um, lack of guaranteed profit measures. In Dungeonborn, not only is it difficult to fight against multiple opponents as a solo, but losing means a complete loss. Even if you acquire valuable items, you may not be able to escape in the end. Very true. Um... Additional solar play, uh, solo play compensation. In Hunt Showdown, some talents are significantly enhanced from playing solo. For example, a certain talent allows solo players to revive once. There's a lot of contention around that, and I think they have to be careful of that. Um, the solo revive thing. Um, in Hunt Showdown, you can burn a body, right? So if you kill a solo, typically you're going to go throw a torch or something on them to try and... Uh, to burn the corpse so they can't revive. But even while they're burning, you've got to sit there and wait for them to burn because um, you can still revive while you're burning. Uh, but yeah, if they're going for something like that, they're going to have to be careful. 
Uh, as you might have noticed, many of the challenges we introduced in preseason or confirmed for season one align with the above summary, such as map structure and route changes, uh, monster placement changes, and the pet system, safe container. We want to fundamentally make solo and team experiences compatible from the ground up, eliminating the difficulty of solo trio balance and pre-teaming issues, and ensuring that new mechanics or gameplay can serve all players. Based on numerous successful extraction games, we believe this is, a, is an achievable goal. In addition to the announced content, more bold, fundamental changes are being designed and developed as we speak. Once they pass internal testing, we will share them with you as soon as possible. We appreciate the patience of our persistent players, and we sincerely invite all solo players to continue providing feedback until you can truly achieve 1v3 and wipe out a team. That's going to be... That's going to take a lot of work. In a game like this, that's going to take a lot of work. Um... A lot of work, a lot of testing. We'll see how that plays out. Part seven, closing words. Lastly, lastly, we want to take a moment to thank all our players who have supported us and believed in our vision for Dungeon Board. Your feedback, both positive and negative, have been invaluable in shaping the game's direction. We're committing to, uh, committed to creating a unique and thrilling experience that stays true to the core of extraction gameplay. Dungeon Board is more than just a game to us. It's a passion project that we're pouring our hearts into. As we move forward with the preseason, as season one and beyond, we're excited to bring you new content, features, overhauls, and improvements. We firmly believe in the potential of Dungeonborn and the community is found, uh, that is formed around it. Support means a lot to us, and we will continue to push boundaries and deliver a game that captivates and challenges you. Thank you for being a part of this journey. We can't wait to see you in the dungeons tomorrow. Um, is this all just stuff we went over yet? It's all stuff we already kind of talked about. So yeah, again, this, this is the stuff we need. They, they say it's a passion project and stuff, but they haven't shown that. This is a step in that direction. This shows that they actually give a shit, that there is some thought being put into it, but they can't go months without talking about this stuff. Again, like even, where was it? Um, the stuff about, oh, here we go. Once they pass internal testing, blah, blah, blah. We get it. We get you want to do internal testing and stuff, but just let us know stuff's going on. Okay, you're working on some stuff internally. Just communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. That's it. People will be so much more understanding if you at least communicate that, hey, we don't have any definite information for you. We don't have anything to specifically tell you yet but we're working on it. We got something coming. Stay tuned. Stuff like that is huge, um, but just going silent for months is not the play. And and the numbers show. The, the game has fallen into a pretty damn bad state. Um, lots of reasons behind that, but a lack of communication is, is a major part, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, good stuff here. Um, much more inspiring than than the stuff back here uh like, like this stuff was okay but again i think this all the stuff we talked about yesterday was stuff that we needed a long time ago to be talked about and now it's not really that exciting but that stuff combined with all this stuff now it's it's a lot more inspiring that they're they're thinking more and they're working on more stuff um much better this time around v much much better um but yeah, we've been going for a while. We've been, oh, it's only a, this is one of our shorter videos. Only about 30, 33 minutes or so. Uh, but yeah, some good stuff there. Um, I don't think there's really anything else I want to talk about. Uh, no, I think that's good. Um, I'll probably check things out tomorrow uh, on stream and see see how the game feels with the, uh, the season whatever. Zero before the storm stuff probably check that out tomorrow uh but yeah i'm gonna go get ready for my grandma's birthday go go celebrate and stuff uh but yeah thank you all so very much for watching you all have a good rest of your days and i will catch you all next time